terms of the BRAF MEC combinations that we have, the, we have kind of two approved combinations, the brafenib and trametinib versus bimorafenib and cobimetinib. And I'd like to sort of talk, take a, kind of a few moments to talk about sort of choosing one over the other, both in terms of uh, response, but also in terms of toxicity. And uh, are, are there certain patient features that you make you choose one over the other? So, Tony, which one well, should we choose? <laughs> so obviously, we'll go back to the, all, the obvious, which is we don't have randomized data. Yes. And we cannot answer So we've never compared them head to head. So <laughs> this I, is all I based on... I think there's got to yeah. be comparison head to head. <laughs> I don't think anybody will do that. Yeah. The totality of the data suggests that they're very similar combinations. So the brafnib trametinib and bemrafnib cobimetinib give roughly the same rate of responses and the progression pre survival and overall survival seems to be within the margin of error of, cli of clinical trials. They do have some peculiar toxicities that are different, even though they're both BRAF and a MEK inhibitor, and when they're given together, the beauty is that some of the side effects go down. The side effects that are induced by BRAF inhibitors inducing paradoxical MAD kinase activation are decreased with the MEK inhibitor. And which ones are those, Tony? Could you give us an example? So, uh, the, uh, skin rashes go down. Uh, joint pains, uh, which are uh, induced by the BRAF inhibitor acting on cells that are wild type for BRAF, they have normal BRAF, but the BRAF inhibitor binding to the wild type BRAF transactivates the MAP kinase signaling, and in the skin and in the joints, it leads to side effects. But then the BRAF inhibitor decreases one of the main side effects from the MEK inhibitor, which is acneiform skin rash, something I don't think we have a direct explanation for, uh, but that's a socially limiting toxicity from MEK inhibitors that decreases in frequency when given together with a PRAF inhibitor. So those toxicities seem to go side by side with the two pairs, but the, uh, whenever bemorafenib is used, it has a peculiar toxicity, which is being photosensitive, uh, where patients then can have uh, sunburns with minimal sun exposure, in Southern California where I practice and maybe even more where, where Georgina practices, these patients try to avoid the sun continuously and they have to be covered all the time. And even indirect sun can lead to a sunburn, which is something that makes them change their lifestyle. But if we go to the other combination, the brafnib trametinib the brafnib brings a very peculiar toxicity, which is fevers and, uh, and sometimes hypotension. Fevers can be high, and there can be chills, and they can happen at any time. So those are patients that may live their life worrying would that happen in a situation where it would be unwanted or uh, some, uh, this, uh, this toxicity may lead to uh, having to adjust doses and going down on the doses. Um, Georgina has, uh, I, I was one of the first investigators working with the brafnib and the brafnib and trametinib and has come up with a series of ways to mitigate that, but continues to be an effect that is limiting to patients. So whenever I, I see a patient where we're going to the, the, decide to start the plus MEK inhibitor, I talk about both combinations, and we go over the pros and cons of each one of them, and honestly, I still haven't made up my mind which one to use. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. the, the one thing just to add to that is that uh, in addition to the combination reducing the risk of rash that we see with single agent BRAF inhibitor, the other side effect that's decreased are the cutaneous squamous cell carcinomas or keratoacanthomas are also significantly decreased with the combination. And Georgina, then uh, Tony mentioned that you know you looked at this uh, the BRAF nib and so on and kind of a way to mitigate this toxicity. So tell us a bit about sort of. Uh, what you tell patients then if they have some of these toxicities? How, how do you mitigate them? So Dose the reductions, which Deb, therapies? Okay. Deb, brafnib and trametinib with the fever. Um, first of all, we know that dose reduction actually does not help. Okay. But an intermittent treatment strategy may. Having said that, we have not prospectively proven that intermittent, so where you have full dose for a number of weeks or a few days and then off, going on, off, on, off, actually is better than continuous dosing in humans. We have not proven that. But, but the concept and the hypothesis is that we are inhibiting the MAP kinase pathway. So if you're going to bother to inhibit it, to stop the cell from dividing and causing apoptosis or death of the cell, do it properly. And we already know that from our randomized trials that single agent BRAF 
you add one milligram of trametinib onto dabrafenib, it improves things a, a bit, but you add two milligrams of trametinib, it's even better. So we do know that there is a dose response with inhibition of the MAP kinase pathway. So I avoid dose reductions at all cost. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to do some intermittent treatment, but um, ultimately I would like to keep the MAP kinase properly inhibited for as long as poss possible. And sometimes we have to revert to steroids in a small number of patients. Often though, if you can get patients through the first three to five months, where they've had quite significant fevers, you can then start to withdraw the steroids. But it's really only 10 to 20% of patients where you ha actually have to use steroids for that, that three month period. So in this then, back to your point, so would you ever use monotherapy BRF no. treatment? Anyone else use monotherapy? No. 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 So no. the answer is, so the consensus is, we have consensus here in the melanoma experts yes. that no monotherapy BRF therapy. And don't and dose reduce other strategies, but yeah. do not dose reduce. And no monotherapy MEC either. Yeah. I mean, BRAF yeah. is the important drug in the combination, but certainly you have ad added efficacy with adding MEC to the BRAF. So. Yeah. Now what about then the duration of therapy? Um, how long do we treat with this, um, the combination BRAF-MEC therapy for this? Yeah, I'm, I'm quick, happy to quickly deal with this because we have a little bit of data on that. Um, and it tends to be continuous and for as long as it's tolerated and the patients haven't progressed. Um, unlike what we saw with the phase one Keynote 001 pembrolizumab data, what we have seen generally, and it's not as large data set as the Keynote 001, that if you have a complete response on dabrafenib and trametinib or a braf met combination, and you stop approximately, consistently, three retrospective small numbers consistently have all shown that about 50% of patients will recur and it tends to occur in the first three months. Mm -hmm. There's no doubt that there is half of them who have a CR that you don't need the treatment, but we can't pick them. So we, are ending, we, are, we end up just continuing treatment. Mm -hmm. Mike, when, when would you switch over to immunotherapy for these patients who, are on, uh, who have BRAF mutations, who are on a BRAF mech combination? When, when do you switch to immunotherapy for them? Yeah, honestly, I don't know. Okay. So I think that that's probably the honest answer is that, again, we've talked about the fact that um, although there's a rationale for this, we, we don't know. One, one thing I would say is that, uh, again, we don't have data in this space, um, but I know I've had patients who uh, were on targeted therapy with BRAF or BRAF mech who progressed, who went on to immunotherapy, responded quite nicely, but then progressed. And in those patients, we've rechallenged with targeted therapy yeah. and often have gotten very nice responses. And so this interesting phenomenon that, again, the resistance that's selected for with continuous treatment, if the patients go off to a different therapy, it's not clear that that resistant phenotype is there anymore. So it is actually possible to go back to that therapy. And again, it's sort of challenging a lot of the dogma that we've had as we have so that sort of both uh, effective targeted therapies and immune therapies. Do you really treat with an agent all the way to resistance or do you switch yeah. as, as your sort of your question yeah. suggested? I, and I have to say at this point, I don't know that anybody has a correct answer for that question. I will say that one of the things that's quite challenging is I have seen some patients who have gotten to a complete response and then have been switched to immune therapy where there's really nothing to follow to let you know if the immune therapy is helping at that point or not. And I think that that's sort of a very challenging way to manage a patient uh, in terms of knowing what to do. Um, so again, I at this point, with the data that we have about patients who've achieved a complete response with targeted therapy, where the more follow-up we have, it's becoming very clear that, again, many of those patients are doing well for a very long time and at this point are continuing on treatment, that for patients who achieve a CR, I'm certainly keeping those patients on, on to targeted therapy. I think the question that uh, does arise is when we see patients who have a very nice initial response but then somewhat plateau, mm -hmm. the question of whether or not that's a window of time to change. But again, a data-free zone, which really goes again back to the gestalt question of how you sort of feel, feel with those patients. And the other thing I would say is I think that uh, I, I would say that I have had patients who for one reason or another have really wanted to make that switch. And some patients, they've then subsequently responded quite nicely to immunotherapy and other ones where it's, you know, have not responded at all. Um, and so there's a real, real sort of heterogeneity there that we really don't understand at this point.